attendees. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Alex Porter. I am a neuro-oncologist here at Mayo Clinic and have been on the faculty for the last 12 years. I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, division chair, Dr. Alan Bryce, who then will introduce you to Dr. Moore. Hello, thank you for being here today. I'm uh, Dr. Bryce. I'm a, a, a genital urinary oncologist here at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. I've been helping to organize this conference for several years now, and uh, we really feel it's, it's one of the most important outreach events we have every year um, to try and, and bring Mayo's expertise uh, to you and, and hopefully try to, uh, you know, kind of ease the burden of, of struggling with a cancer diagnosis and, and what that means for, for life and, and, and quality and function. Um, you know, the, this is very much meant to be interactive. Uh, we are here for you and we're happy to take this conversation in whatever direction uh, you would like. Um, uh, Dr. Porter and I and Dr. Moore have been doing this for several years. So, we, you know, we, we, we know what you come to this conference with um, and, uh, you know, we're very much, uh, we're very much open to, to, like I say, having the, the conversations that are going to kind of help answer the questions on your mind now. I'd like to introduce, uh, Dr. Cassandra Moore. Uh, Dr. Moore is one of our oncologists, also focuses on genital urinary cancer, uh, particularly cancers of the prostate, bladder, uh, kidney, and testes. Uh, and we also have here Dr. Rachova, who's one of our uh, fellows in neuro-oncology. Uh, so uh, Dr. Moore, if you'd like to say a few words. Um, good morning. And um, yeah, so I've um, been with the group at Mayo and I'm definitely happy to be here to help field any questions that you may have um, about uh, cancer care in general, um, prostate obviously specifically. Um, from an African-American standpoint. Um, so I welcome the questions. Thank you. So we encourage you all to use the Q&A um, or to please uh, put your questions in the chat. The goal for the session is to be informal um, and to truly uh, just be a resource to help uh, demystify anything that uh, may not be clear to try to um, bring some additional education for uh, those areas that uh, you might have questions about. And so please uh, feel free, like I said, through the Q&A and also through the chat. Um, and we're happy to uh, be here for um, as long as you all need, uh, because really this conference is about all of you, our patients, who um, we earnestly uh, desire to serve well. So maybe to, while you're thinking of your questions, um, uh, to get the um, uh, to get the conversation going, I'll, I'll ask a question uh, maybe to uh, Dr. Moore. And so um, one of the uh, things that has been talked about um, quite a lot and maybe brought to the forefront, and this is, I guess, for Dr. Moore or Dr. Bryce, it's more of a general or colorectal camp question, actually. Um, one of the things that got brought to light that really hit a lot of um, people sort of nationally, uh, globally, was the recent passing of Chadwick Boseman. And so um, there's been a lot of conversation about colorectal cancer, colorectal cancer in the African-American community and screening. And so I was wondering, Dr. Moore, or, um, if you could shed a little bit of light on um, screening, maybe as it pertains to colorectal, but also as it pertains to prostate, which is another um, area that um, uh, in many ways disproportionately impacts African-Americans. Sure. <clears throat> so um, obviously anyone with a family history um, of uh, colon cancer um, should undergo screening earlier, typically um, 10 years or so before the diagnosis um, of their family member. Um, also in general, historically, the um, magic cutoff for screening has been 50 um, for the general population. That actually um, should be lower, closer to 45 for African-American males, um, especially because the um, risk obviously is higher and um, presentation can be at a younger age. Um, so um, I, I think we definitely recommend um, screening and contacting your, your primary care provider to have that performed with colonoscopy um, and other discuss further other options with them. 
Dr. Bryce, do you have something to add? Yeah, so, so without question, you know, the, the best way to treat cancer is early. Um, and, and, and so screening is always where we want to start this conversation, right? We, we, you know, cancers are most easily cured when they're caught at an early stage uh, through screening. And cancers are far more likely to be fatal if they're caught later when they've, you know, spread and become more advanced. And so it's always a, a key part of, you know, our efforts and, and patient education to really focus on this idea of, of trying to get everyone in for screening. For the prostate cancer population, and, you know, I've, I've worked with um, a number of different, uh, you know, African-American men's groups in, in this conversation. You know, despite everything you hear about um, controversies over PSA, you know, should you do it, should you not? You know, here at Mayo Clinic, we've never wavered. We've always said, yes, you should do PSA screening. Yes, we should start at an earlier age for the African-American population. A key question that always comes up from the patients is, well, do I have to have the rectal exam? Do you have to do that prostate exam? And the answer is, we prefer to do both. You know, ideally, we do both the rectal and the PSA, but, you know, you don't have to do the rectal. If, if you don't, you know, if you don't want your um, primary care doc to do that, even just the PSA alone is better than nothing, right? So we really do want to start that. And, um, uh, you know, once a year PSA screening starting at age, you know, 45, I think it would, would be best. I'd love to see that in all patients because what happens is if the cancer gets too advanced, right, gets farther along, if we catch it too late, then, you know, it, it might metastasize and, and then not be curable. So um, the best way to treat cancer is early. And so that applies to colon cancer. You know, now, now in the, you know, in, in the case of, you know, Bozeman and, and, you know, somebody dying at such a young age of colorectal cancer, you know, that, that is highly unusual. And, and those are the exceptions for sure. And that's where family history becomes so important, right? To identify the really high risk patients. Because of course, you know, getting cancer in your thirties wouldn't fall into guidelines at all for colonoscopy, right? And so, you know, th this is where we constantly need to continue to, you know, do the research to push boundaries, to try and figure out how, what do we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again? I mean, that, that's the driving question for all of us that work in this field. Right. I mean, um, you know, I always say, you know, as an oncologist and, and like I say, I'm a prostate oncologist, but as an oncologist, you know, my my burning desire is to actually put myself out of business. Right. Let's cure cancer so that no one ever has to come to us anymore. Right. And the best way right now to cure cancer is to catch it early um, and just let the surgeons take care of it. Thank you so much, Dr. Bryce. I want to welcome Ms. Pratcher, who put a question in our uh, chat box. She is uh, recently completed breast cancer treatment, and she's asking us if there's any relationship between a son's prostate cancer and the mother's breast cancer or colorectal cancer. Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. Bryce, could you comment on that? And Dr. Moore, you want to take that, or I'm happy to... Uh, you can go ahead either, either way, go ahead. Okay, so, so um, you know, I, I actually, so here at Mayo, uh, we all do a lot of work actually in, in cancer genetics as well. Uh, and this is a very important question. And the answer is, it is absolutely possible that there's a connection. Okay, now, you know, cancers can run in families. I think we all know that you see families where, where there can be a lot of cancer. The most common gene that causes hereditary breast cancer is called BRCA. There's two ver variants of that, BRCA1 and BRCA2. The most common gene that causes hereditary prostate cancer is the same gene, BRCA. And that's something that people don't always realize. You know, when we talk about cancer genes that, that can run in families, most of them don't just cause one cancer. In fact, almost all of them will cause multiple cancers. And so BRCA is associated with breast and ovarian cancer, and that's what most people know, but it's just also associated with prostate and um, pancreas cancer. Colorectal cancer is most often caused by uh, genes that cause something called leaf frown many syndrome. And leaf frown syndrome, and there's a couple other syndromes as well, but you know, these syndromes also 
can increase the risk of other cancers, including prostate cancer. So yes, uh, there can be a connection. What we recommend is that you get family testing for inherited genetic disorders. And you know, Dr. Moore is running a study right now um, towards this end. Uh, Mayo recently completed another study. Um, as you might expect, so I'll, I'll make this point, this is a bit of a, a segue because you know, you've asked the question. The problem with genetic data we have right now, nationally, internationally, is as you might expect, most of the database is Caucasian people. It is, it is white predominant. And we do not have enough Africans or African-Americans or you know, people of African descent in these databases. We do not have enough Hispanics. And what that means is, you know, when we say that, okay, this gene, BRCA, you know, increases your chance of breast cancer by, you know, let's say two, two times, five times, whatever the number. That's really data at, that applies to mostly the Caucasian population. And we don't necessarily know as well what impact it's having in the African black population. And so that's what Dr. Moore's efforts and other studies at Mayo and other places are looking at is, you know, we need to really sort out um, what impact these genes have in African Americans. Is it different than in Caucasians, than in Hispanics, than in Asians, you know, um, because that's a bias that's built into the data. You know, it's a bias that we really need to fix because it makes a difference. Um, so I don't know if Dr. Moore, you want to expand on that, but. No, absolutely. I would agree. Um, it is so important. And I was hoping to have the opportunity to discuss this today um, for enrollment in clinical trials um, so that we do have that information to go on and we can be confident that when we're treating patients um, th that we are using data that, that um, you know, is appropriate for them and will, will um, best serve them in terms of in their treatment and, and their um, course of therapy. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I have a question. It's commonly come up in our clinics. A lot of our patients is asking if chemotherapy effect is different in African-American patients and what should they be worried about or ask about from their doctors? So I think in general, um, you know, we, we chemotherapy, so there's a, a whole host of different types of treatments that we use, um, either whether it be chemotherapy or especially in um, prostate cancer, we use hormonal therapy, breast cancer as well. Um, and so the, we know there are standard um, side effects and there's a whole range of side effects um, that is individual to each patient. And we can oftentimes touch on the most common that we see, but um, treatments can affect anyone individually. I think it's important um, to highlight going into your treatment for cancer, not only from a standpoint of we talk early on about you know, diet and nutrition and other medical conditions being um, managed properly, being important for reducing risk of developing cancers, but also while undergoing cancer treatment, um, it can definitely impact outcomes. And it can also you know, um, interplay with the treatments that we're giving. For example, if we're giving steroids as part of, of chemotherapy and there's issues with uncontrolled diabetes, that can definitely cause um, complications. And so not only um, you know, speaking to your oncologist or your um, primary doctor about what medical conditions that you have, um, talk, trying to do the best in terms of remaining active and, and keeping um, your health um, and, and medical conditions controlled and really partnering um, is, is very important through the, through the treatment course. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, I'm going to direct my next question to Dr. Bryce. We know that uh, given the historical atrocities that have happened in the African-American communities in the past regarding clinical trials. Uh, can you please talk a little bit, how do we build the trust with African-American community and how do we uh, open our arms to enroll the patients and get this information that could be actually helpful for them in the future? 
Yeah, so so that the historical context, you know, is absolutely still alive and impactful today. There is no, you know, denying that, and there is, um, you know, there is no getting away from it. You know, there are, you know, you have doctors today who say, look, well, you know, what can I do about that? How can I change it? It's not about changing it. Okay, so in the modern context, it is. It, it, talking about Tuskegee and the syphilis studies, talking about you know so many uh, of these um, you know historical episodes is part of the educational process for all investigators. Number one, so we do not let this historical knowledge die. Right, we very much keep it alive and remind people, um, all of our trainees, um, about what has happened you know in this country in the past. Right. Um, and, you know, this is why, you know, the safety mechanisms, um, all of the regulatory standards are, are in place right now. But, you know, all that aside, despite, you know, despite whatever safety mechanisms, mechanisms are in place, I mean, your question gets to, you know, there's issues of trust building. Um, there's issues of, um, you know, there's issues, frankly, of changing the fundamental cultural dynamics, you know, in medicine, in society as well. But, you know, obviously for us here, we're talking about medicine. Um, part of it, it, it has to happen on multiple levels. There is no easy answer. And this is the problem is, you know, people want easy answers. No, there are no easy answers. You know, it took us hundreds of years to get to this point, And we're not going to we're not going to just. Um, you know, reverse things. We can't just tell people, hey, we're different. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It doesn't work that way, right? Um, you know, absolutely, we have to meet people where they are. You know, we have to go, you know, to the African-American community, to other under un historically underrepresented communities and meet them where they are and understand, look, what do they need from us as opposed to, you know, us trying to say, well, this is the way medicine should work. So, so there it is. Right. Um, you know, I, and, and, you know, we, we say it explicitly. I mean, we just be honest, look, you know, we also need more African-American doctors because people want to go to doctors that they feel comfortable with. Right. Um, which means, you know, we need to work with high school students. We need to work with college students. We need to work with medical students, uh, and help, you know, help, populations where you know they have a harder time working through the you know, kind of life and career success ladder and we need to help them kind of get onto that ladder um you know that's that's more the long term right um we need to like i say with these studies you know we, we need to number one design studies that that frankly deal with the questions that different populations need answered, right? As opposed to, you know, um, as opposed to continuing to do studies that are, you know, dominated by, you know, Caucasian patients, right? Um, because that helps part of the population, but it doesn't help everyone. Um, you know, without question here at Mayo Clinic, and, and I'll, you know, I'll ask doctors uh, Porter and more to speak to it as well. Um, but, you know, we've really had to, you know, hold up a mirror and say, look, um, you know, we need to be more explicit and louder about saying, you know, we're anti-racist, right? Um, all of this has gone on too long. It's really time to shift. I mean, hopefully we're finally at a historical moment where things will be different, you know, kind of once and for all, because it just hasn't been good enough up to now. Um, obviously getting into you know difficult topics to talk about but um you know we need to get beyond that um and you know like i say the answer is never at one level i mean you know th there's a lot of things we need to do and we need to address it and attack it and work at it at every level um with humility right and with commitment um um and you know, I, I uh, w like I say, we're not dismissing, we're not ignoring, we're not trying to pretend that the past didn't happen. We can't do that, right? We really need to, to tackle it head on. So I think, um, 
you know, I, I, we, we try to come to, you know, a, like the people on this conference today and the various communities with all humility to say, um, you know, we want to work on this and we want to work with you on, on fixing this. So I'll, I'll guess I'll ask, you know, Dr. Porter maybe to, to chime in and Dr. Moore. Yeah, I really think representation from um, the entire community helps us understand the spectrum of disease better. And we have so many instances, so many trials, so many um, um, studies that really show us sort of this one aspect because out of 300 patients, for example, only one or two might be black or African-American. And there's a real possibility that we might be missing how um, other groups respond to a particular drug or what other side effects would be appropriate for us to um, counsel on. And so um, as Dr. Bryce mentioned, for all investigators, there's a series of trainings that um, takes us all through the history. So um, because it is um, imperative that we understand the history so that we don't um, have the same atrocities occur in the future. Um, but I really want to um, emphasize that the research that's being done currently through these, you know, um, through major institutions, tertiary referral centers um, like Mayo Clinic is held to the highest standards, the highest rigors. And we're not talking about experimenting on communities just for experiment's sake. There are all kinds of safety measures that are um, in place. And so I hope that the message that I'm able to convey is um, it really is, uh, clinical trials are an opportunity to help us advance the science. They're meant to benefit and not harm. Yes, we have to start to understand, um, like I said, the spectrum of how um, different medications, different uh, diseases may present themselves. Um, but certainly, um, in, in, there's so many studies that point to patients who actually are enrolled in clinical trials in the end, end up receiving better care because there's more touch points and there's more resources and all of that. So I hope to start to demystify the conversation around clinical trial participation. I know there's been a lot in the media right now about clinical trials and vaccines and COVID and you know going to the black community first because we are um, have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And I think um, um, there's, there's a really fine line that we're all trying to navigate between some of the, the rhetoric um, about experimental therapies. Um, but I hope that you'll find that your oncologist or radiation oncologist or neuro oncologist, I hope that you'll use them as a resource to really be educated about what's being asked of you. Um, and that you're very clear on there's always a consent form and there's a clinical uh, uh, trials coordinator that'll go through those things with you. Make sure that you get all of your questions answered um, so that you're well informed going into it. There's nothing that any of us ever are trying to hide. Um, and if there's some question that you have, um, it's a perfect opportunity to bring it to the forefront because there's a possibility that we just didn't think about it um, because there are so many blind spots that all of us have. Um, so that's my perspective that really participation in clinical trials helps us advance the science and helps us understand how all groups are impacted by disease, not just one. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter. On this note, uh, I just want to uh, ask you another question. I, since I've been with you for a few months, so we had a few patients who are African Americans, and I saw their enthusiasm, emotional reaction to seeing you as their doctor. And I'm sure you had this uh, events many, many times through your career. And one of the four neurooncologists in the country. Uh, how do you think that diversity influences trust in patients? Yeah, thank you. I think that we are all just as humans looking to be seen and looking to be understood and have our experiences validated. And I think that, um, you know, there's always, um, all of us uh, have the capacity for caring for patients that uh, don't look like us. And that's something that we do every day um, and we try to do it uh, well. Um, but there's also those um, sort of unspoken uh, similarities those um, sort of cultural nuances, if you will, that are shared between um, certain groups that um, make that trust 
between patient and provider so much um, sort of easier. Um, there are sort of walls that um, kind of automatically get broken down um, just because of a shared experience. And I'm not saying that to suggest that all Black or all uh, African Americans are um, homogeneous in their experience because it's quite the opposite. Um, but the truth is that um, there's just a, a shared level of understanding. And so to Dr. Bryce's point, we really um, recognize that in order to um, provide patients sort of with the highest level of care, we want to have a diverse physician workforce. And so that means we have to invest um, in the younger generations and we have to train them up and we have to encourage them um, to see themselves in careers like ours. And so I'm fortunate to, um, to be here at Mayo and in this division and, um, and to have uh, Dr. Mora as another African-American woman um, treating can patients with cancer. It's pretty rare to have uh, two in a single division. And so it's, um, uh, it really is a privilege when I'm able to um, also uh, take care of Black or African-American patients. And um, yes, I get moved by the enthusiasm as well, Dr. Rachova. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Dr. Moore, can you co comment on your experience? Sure, yes, I would agree with Dr. Porter um, in terms of just, um, you know, obviously we care for all of our patients and, and really enjoy, you know, we're drawn to this um, work um, because of the patients and because of, you know, what we, what we can do and those interactions that we have across the board. But um, there is obviously, um, you know, just that, like you said, cultural nuances and some of the some of the um, um, unspoken um, things that where where there is a connection there, um, and so it is. It is. We are um, very happy and um, to see, um, you know, that we can help our community um, and to have those um, medical and professional. Um, relationships with, with patients, um, so I would agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Uh, I'm gonna uh, address uh, Ms. Pratcher question, it, which is very insightful. And she's saying that how doctors and medical profession currently interact with and engage with African-Americans uh, is a barrier to trust. There are so many stories about the lack of care or different care given to African Americans compared to whites. Uh, can you speak to how the medical profession is addressing this concern or if it's even a concern? Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Rachova. You know, I'll take that question. It's a huge concern. And um, we recognize that all of us as humans, we um, have bias. And um, we developed bias neurologically, and I get excited when I start talking about um, brain development, but I won't go too far um, on this, but we, we all develop these um, kind of biases and assumptions to stay alive. And so that's why we, you know, if you touch a hot stove uh, one time, you learn that it's hot and you never touch it again. And so I think that, um, one of the things that we recognize in, um, in medicine is that sometimes those biases um, can be triggered, like uh, multitasking, um, if we're doing too much all at once, or if we're, you know, tired at the end of the day, all of those things. And because we're all humans, we still are um, subject to our stereotypes and assumptions. And so this is something that we've really, um, that we take to heart and we're um, uh, engaging in educating physicians and, and encouraging them to try to seek out their blind spots and where they have um, uh, issues of bias. Because for, for all of us, I would say, um, our first priority is to do no harm. And so I don't think that any of our colleagues are entering into patient rooms saying, I'm going to treat this patient poorly because of how they look or because of their background. Um, but instead, what might happen because of our um, sort of multitasking brain and uh, the fact that we may hold some different assumptions, um, our body language might be different towards certain patient, or we may smile more or um, answer a question much more uh, thoughtfully or thoroughly for one than we might another. And so... Um, there's a lot of education happening, uh, not just in our sort of continuous medical education uh, that we all are um, a part of, but also here at Mayo. 
And for any new faculty or staff that joins us, there's um, a communication and healthcare course that's required in order to make it from a, a with, you know, the initial stages of employment at Mayo to sort of full employment, if you will. And so, um, and that's one of the aspects talking about um, sort of what our communication style is. Do we change it in certain situations? Have we been influenced um, by issues of um, bias um, or assumptions and really trying to instill um, not only in our colleagues, but also in our learners, this concept of cultural humility, that we want to move from beyond this uh, perception of cultural competence where we have check boxes, do you have a translator available, check box, um, but really understanding that um, every person is unique, um, bringing uh, to sort of the office, bringing to the, the uh, conversation, a unique perspective and in a unique background. And it would behoove all of us to be curious about that other human that's sitting in front of us, rather than coming from a place of assumption or bias or judgment. And so um, to your point, Ms. Pratcher, we recognize that yes, um, there are uh, differences in how African-Americans are treated. Um, and that has led to disparities in all realms, cancer care too. Um, but, you know, we see these disparities more recently uh, illuminated with COVID, um, but it's something that we're actively aware of and, um, and working to try to improve. And the other thing that helps, I mentioned all the educational efforts, but again, having a diverse physician workforce helps us um, because for those who may have never interacted with a Black or African-American person before, having me and uh, Dr. Moore sort of in their hallway with their office next door might ha help shape um, their view. Um, and we know that that's true for our learners too, having exposure to different physicians of different genders of different races, all of that makes their education um, uh, better and lets us take better care of patients in the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter. Um, I'm just gonna ask a very general question uh, to Dr. Bryce. Um, I guess we see a lot of patients and they come to Mayo to get their care. So the question is besides expert care from cancer doctors, what other resources can we provide to our patients? Yeah, so I mean, the, the cancer journey obviously is a difficult one and, and, and you know, cancer, in a lot of ways, psychologically impacts patients differently than m most other diagnoses, right? I mean, and it's not just the patient, of course, it's the family as well. Um, so, you know, e even though, you know, you might think that the, the uh, our focus is, is mostly on, say, questions of treatment, um, you know, there, there are also resources and efforts that go into trying to think about you know, what is the impact on the psychological impact on the patient? What about the caregiver, right? The caregiver is a huge part of it. Um, you know, we have child life specialists who try to, who, who provide resources for, you know, what about a young child whose parent gets diagnosed with cancer? You know, what can we do to help them understand what's going on? You know, things like that. You know, social workers to help with, you know, any number of different issues that come up, you know, people who have difficulty accessing transportation to get to their, you know, appointments. Um, you know, if someone's undergoing a transplant, they're going to be in town for, you know, two months. I mean, there, there are uh, things like Hope Lodge, I mean, housing resources, et cetera. Um, you know, things like translators, whatnot, nutrition, um, you know, exercise, integrative therapies. I mean, these are other parts of cancer care that we think about. Um, uh, and then, you know, we, we try to put on symposia like this, you know, it's the first year we're doing it over the web as opposed to in person. So we're still learning and try to figure that out. But, you know, we, we try to, we're, we're trying to think about ways to um, provide resources and support the patients, you know, a, across multiple platforms, across, you know, the kind of full spectrum of needs. Um, it's big. I mean, it's big, it's broad. Um, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that, you know, we do it all optimally, but we're always, always looking at, you know, ways to do more financial toxicity. I mean, you know, cancer care can be expensive. And, you know, we have staff who, who, who their focus, their, their entire focus is trying to figure out how to fix financial toxicity. Obviously things are just going in a bad direction in this country in terms of, you know, the out-of-pocket costs for medical care. Uh, and needing to fix that. Um, uh, so, so we're always thinking in these terms. Um, 
and um, you know, if, if the you know question is, you know, do we need to think about you know X, Y, or Z, uh, you know, whatever it is that affects cancer patients? The answer to all that is yes. We need to think about it, and then and then it just becomes kind of a um, a resource and prioritization question, and you know, what 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 can we get to? We're trying to knock down all these things. I would say, you know, um, from every angle. Um, so. So there's a lot to the cancer journey, and that's part of what this symposium is for, right? There's a lot of different parts to this symposium, um, different lectures to try to deal with the different um, needs that patients have. And I guess I'll, I'll put a little plug in for all the uh, people online right now. You know, we do do a, a we do send you a survey at the end of this, and and we absolutely look at every single survey. So if there are things, resources that we can provide in the future. Uh, for the next iteration of this conference, please give us your ideas and, and we will absolutely work on it. Thank you so much, Dr. Bryce. So we have another question from our uh, participants from Annie Marie. She's asking, where do you see the greatest difference in physiological response in Afro-American people? Is it radiotherapy, chemotherapy or hormonal therapy? Or if there's any of that information available? Dr. Mood, could you take this question for us? Um, sure, and Dr. Bryce, you may want to join in because I don't think that we, I mean, there's really, um, from a physiologic response, if you're talking about side effects um, versus response to treatment, I think each patient is an individual. Um, and so the, the, you know, full range of responses is, uh, can be about as long as the number of people that you, you have and you're giving these medications to. Um, so I don't know that we, you know, really have information. And in terms of, however, if you're talking about even any of these things, that's one of the, um, you know, benefits and the, the, positive outcomes that could come with getting more um, people that are underrepresented, underrepresented currently in clinical trials to be involved because then we will have um, data on side effects and response rates and we'll be able to, if we have enough people of any one, you know, like for example, African-American um, uh, descent, then we'll, we'll have more of that information. But right now, from a, you know, in a clinic, it's, it's really based on the individual. And in our clinical trials, they're so far skewed into Caucasian populations that we can't really make any differences. Dr. Bryce, do you have anything additional? Yeah, I mean, I, I can, um, so I can answer this question the way we look at it as a scientist as well. Um, you know, part of the issue is exactly what Dr. Moore is saying is, some of these questions we don't have answers to because we don't have the necessary data. And, and that's a problem, right? I mean, it, and, and I think, you know, COVID has probably been a hard lesson in science for the public in so many ways. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do bad science and get bad data, and that's not helpful, right? Good science requires kind of rigor and discipline to get good information and good answers. Because of course, bad answers can lead to people doing the wrong thing and, and um, the situation gets worse, not better. Now, from a scientific perspective then, um, it's not gonna be a generalizable answer. So when you talk about radiation therapy, you know, radiation really affects human cells in a fairly predictable way. So the side effects of radiation are mostly going to have to do, the physiological response is really going to have more to do with what part of the body you're treating, what tissue, and, and does the patient have any other susceptibility? There are some specific genetic uh, features that can make a person really respond poorly to radiation, but mostly it's going to have to do with, you know, what tissue are you treating, right? The brain responds differently to radiation than the leg does, okay? When you talk about medicines, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, various medicines, one of the key drivers and differences to response has to do with how the body metabolizes drugs. So we all know these people who say, oh, I can't take that medicine. It doesn't do anything for me. 
or, oh, if I take that medicine, I go crazy. It really affects me, you know, even something like Benadryl, let's say, right? Some people it works for, other people it doesn't, or, or Zantac for heartburn, you know, things like that. One of the key drivers of those differences is going to be genetics and how we metabolize drugs, something called pharmacogenomics. So in some people, they take a drug and their body gets rid of it in 30 minutes, just gets rid of it fast. Other people, they take a drug that hangs around for six hours. Obviously, the way that drug affects those two patients is going to be very different. The genetic profile of African Americans is obviously different than Caucasian Americans or Asian Americans or or Native Americans or whatnot. One of the, but, but, but a nuance here and a really important nuance is a genetic variation in Africans is actually massive. So, so, so because Africa is the cradle of humanity, because humans have been there longer than you know anywhere else, and because of the geography of that massive continent, okay, and the way that, that populations really didn't mix, you know, the genetic difference between an East African and a West African. So, you know, somebody from, say, um, uh, Congo, you know, uh, versus, you know, the, uh, along the Congo River versus someone from Kenya, that genetic variation is bigger than the genetic variation between a Japanese and an Englishman. Okay, because those populations have been apart for millions of years, as opposed to the Englishman and the Japanese that have been apart for, you know, half that time. And so it gets more complicated. We actually can't batch all African Americans together or all black people together. We have to get down to the level of talking about genetics. But in order to then answer those questions, right, we actually have to do the studies, right? We have to generate the data. So the answer to most of this is I can't actually tell a patient up front. For most of my drugs, I can't tell any patient up front which side effects they're going to get. My standard narrative for my patients, right, is, is, you know, when we're starting a drug and I'm talking about the side effects of this treatment, you know, this drug tends to cause this or that. What I tell people is that the first cycle of that drug, you know, the first three to four weeks, that's where we're going to find out their side effect profile because every patient's different. And so I, I actually figure out a patient's response through trial and error. I mean, it's the only way to do it. You know, even for a Caucasian patient, I can't tell them today, you're going to get this side effect and the next person's not. We, we just don't have that level of, of knowledge yet. So that's an area of active research. Thank you so much, Dr. Bryce and Dr. Moore. Dr. Porter, do you have any comments in regards to brain tumors and this information for central nervous system disease? Yeah, you know, we really, unfortunately, we really don't know. Um, we know that within brain tumor research itself, there's severe underrepresentation um, from populations of color. And so, um, uh, as Dr. Bryce said, we really do learn just from each patient we encounter. Um, but to my knowledge, in terms of um, response rates uh, or side effect profile for radiation therapy, um, and or for the chemotherapies that we use um, for treating primary brain tumors themselves. Um, to our knowledge right now, we say there doesn't appear to be a difference um, for gender or race. Um, what we're starting to learn though, it's really interesting in glioblastoma, which is the most aggressive form of brain cancer, um, about one in 10 patients or so will be a long-term survivor from this tumor. And so the average survival from that's sort of all, all patients who have this diagnosis is just under two years. Um, but one in 10 patients will live, will live five years and beyond with this. And we're starting to find out that women seem to be more likely to be long-term survivors than men. Um, and the reason for why that is, uh, is still sort of starting to be uh, uh, looked at in terms of those sex differences um, and patients' uh, tumors and sort of the genetics that uh, play a role in that. Um, and so once we start to understand that a little bit better, um, then we have to then figure out, well, how do we make everybody 
uh, a long-term survivor. So what is that? How can we crack that code and, and come up with a particular medication to, um, if we can alter certain genes um, or create certain uh, mutations so that um, everyone uh, can live longer with this devastating disease. And I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, attempting at all to oversimplify the conversation and say, well, everybody needs to be a woman. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but certainly we're seeing some trends um, and it takes so much time for us to further the understanding. But at this moment in time, there really doesn't appear to be any major difference between how uh, patients of different races um, tolerate cancer care, where we do see um, some disparity or some difference is um, how patients from different races are actually being treated for their cancer, for their brain cancer. And some of that has to do with access to care, access to places like Mayo or tertiary referral centers, access. We know that for successful brain cancer treatment, it requires the coming together of multiple disciplines um, and uh, whether patients have access, like I said, to those multiple disciplines really makes a difference in survival. Um, and so there is some literature that would suggest that socioeconomics might impact that even more so than race. And so whether somebody has access to a primary care physician and whether somebody um, you know, presents earlier in their course of disease or later in their course of disease. When we started this conversation, we talked about screening. Unfortunately for brain cancers, there's no screening. So patients develop symptoms and then the diagnosis is made. But we know there's a difference in how well patients do based on the size of their tumor at presentation. Um, so some of those things we know can impact different populations differently. But in terms of the treatment, themselves, the treatment itself, we have not yet uh, identified differences there. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter. And just to bring back the screening question, one of the most common cancers is breast cancer. So I would like to pose a question. What are the most common considerations African-American women should think about if they're diagnosed, if their relative diagnosed with breast cancer? Maybe Dr. Bryce could take the question. Yeah, so, so tumor by tumor, there are differences in how cancers can present in different, you know, ethnic and racial populations. Um, and, um, uh, you know, for breast cancer in African-American women, or, well, let me back up. We, we see fairly consistency, we're, we're, consistently, we're seeing it more and more in various cancer types, that when patients get equal access to care, they get pretty equal outcomes. Right. So, you know, African-Americans versus Caucasians versus Hispanics in a, in a single center receiving the same care will get fairly similar outcomes. The biggest issue without question is access to care um, and making sure that they're they're getting the same care. If they get the same care, then they'll get equal outcomes for the most part. Right. So the biggest component is, is access. Um, but then there there are other differences, you know, in. African-American women, um, you know, screening mammograms get, have limitations in terms of, say, breast density and whatnot, and some populations are harder to test than others. African-American women, the, the density can be higher, and sometimes the mammography then is, is less reliable. I mean, there's difficulties there. Um, the, um, the family, again, the family history conversations, um, you know, are very important looking at the genetics. I mean, there, there's no question with that. But without question, I mean, the biggest thing is has to do with access. And so it goes back to the tr trust question that was asked earlier, right? I mean, why are there barriers to access? Some of it is people don't want to come in. They're not trusting. Uh, some of it is going to be the, um, you know, socioeconomic. Some of it's going to be geography, I mean, one of the issues here for, for Mayo Clinic Arizona, I mean, we know this, we, we happen to be located up here in North Phoenix off of the 101. And this is maybe one of the most least diverse zip codes in Phoenix, right? Um, and so, you know, our Hispanic patients, for example, have to drive a lot farther uh, to get here. And so, you know, things like that certainly impact access. Um, so, you know, if a patient gets plugged in, if they get equal access, they largely have equal outcomes. It's really the access question that's the biggest in my mind. Thank you so much for your input. Um, I think we have another question. 
Um, no, uh, I think I thank all the panelists, Dr. Mo, Dr. Porter, and Dr. Bryce, and I would like to give you opportunity for final comments, and then at that point we'll be able to close our conference. Yeah, so I would ask if anybody has any final uh, questions, so please put those in uh, in the chat. Um, but really, this is such a, a pleasure and really a privilege for all of us to um, uh, be with you in this way. Um, there are um, so many challenges with um, uh, COVID that we really couldn't have foreseen. Um, one of the opportunities, though, that we recognize is um, being able to have sessions like this um, that now kind of take away the barrier of uh, location. You know, where in town is the conference going to be? Can people get there? All of those sorts of things. You know, I realize that some of you might be dialing in from work today. And so as we look for ways to try to limit the barriers to sort of engagement um, for patients with their health care, this is really a wonderful opportunity um, for us. So thank you um, for being here today. And um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I think the final um, thought before I um, turn it next maybe to Dr. Moore um, would just be to um, Oh, I just see a note in the chat. We have someone watching from Brazil, which is so awesome. Um, so, you know, I, um, I am really hopeful for our future. I'm hopeful for the future, um, not just in our understanding of disease. I really hope within my career time that um, those statistics that I shared with you uh, about glioblastoma will be much different. And I, um, I look forward really to passing that torch to Dr. Rachova as the next generation of um, clinician scientists who also try to move that dial. Um, but I, I do think that our future is bright, and I do think that we're at um, kind of a global awakening about the importance of representation and inclusion. And, um, and so uh, I'm proud to work at Mayo, a place that's really taking these things so seriously. Um, and so um, thank you again for, uh, for being here, and I'll turn it to Dr. Moore for her final thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Porter, and um, that's difficult to follow. <laughs> I would echo everything that you said in terms of, um, you know, where we are. I think it's, you know, I, I, I hope that we do have the opportunity again to have face-to-face -face interaction because, um, you know, that that definitely is a benefit, but I'm, I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to still be able to um, be here and reach out to folks, like you said, you know, from Brazil and all over the world um, to really increase um, engagement and access. So um, I would um, share Dr. Porter's um, enthusiasm and, um, optimism about the future of where we are in terms of um, cancer. Um, you know, it's, there's been an explosion in the past several years of just developments and we've learned so much more. And um, now with more engagement of more people, um, you know, we, we can continue to take that further. So um, I thank you all for the opportunity and for your time in joining us today. And I will um, defer to Dr. Bryce. Yeah, I, I um, uh, you know, doc, Dr. Moore and, and Dr. Porter do such a wonderful job. I mean, uh, I don't know that I can add to that. Um, uh, you know, without question, you know, the, these issues of, of you know, cultural competency, cultural change. I mean, j just just finally um, getting uh, society and the way we do things to, to where it needs to be and where we all want it to be. Um, I, I hope I hope that we are at a historic moment, and we're all certainly committed to that. And um, uh, you know, we appreciate your engagement. Um, you know, everyone who's here on the line, and and you know, as I said, um, you know, at the top, if you would give us your feedback, um, you know, I personally look at every single comment that we've gotten over the years. That, that every year I've been involved in this conference. Um, you know, we are trying to improve and um, and solve problems on every level. So, so any feedback you have, uh, please send it in. Um, you know, I, I like the comment that was made earlier. I think it was Dr. Porter. You know, just just focusing on this idea of humility. Um, you know, one of the the big uh, weaknesses a physician can have, as you might imagine. You know, we were all kind of. You know, we were top of our class, we're successful, we're pretty smart. We think we're smart at a lot of things. Uh, but, 
you know, we're, we're smart and we're good at certain things. We have blind spots and others, and we do best when we, you know, we listen and, and build big teams um, and, and get ideas from lots of different places. We're not good at everything. So please, you know, share any feedback that you think is important, anything you'd like us to be thinking about. Um, uh, we, we are paying attention um, and we appreciate, you know, any help, any ideas you can give us. So. So thank you for being on the line. I appreciate it. I I, uh, uh, I don't mean to have the last word here, but I um, I I personally appreciate uh, you know um, everyone who's here on the line and and uh, and my colleagues here at Mayo. So thank you.